Hi everyone, I'm Chris Perry, a minister at the Westlink Church, and I'm excited to start a new series of videos talking about some of the trickier parts of scripture and Christian theology. Now, I have about 700 little daily devotionals that I started making during the pandemic, and now I'm going to transition and start doing some longer form teaching. You know, a lot of my ministry in recent years and a lot of my personal journey has been really about asking and dealing with hard questions, recognizing the places where some traditional Christian beliefs maybe are problematic or it's hard to, to fit them together. Or the, the easy answers that you are given don't really seem to work anymore. Now, one of the terms that gets used for this is deconstruction. Of course, obviously, we all know it's the, the sexy new trend where you feel out of step with your community and question your deepest held beliefs and sense of self. It's great. Now, honestly, despite what some people will say, asking questions and seeking truth is the move of faith. And so that's what we're trying to do here. And it's not just about staying in a place of deconstruction, but it's moving towards reconstruction. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to get everything sorted out. It doesn't mean that it's a one-time process. Um, it, it's something that goes on through your life, as I have learned. And also, I can't say what it's going to look like for you on the other side of all this. And so I'm not here to prescribe how your journey should go. I'm not here to give you the definitive answer to any of these questions. But I want to give you a space to think about some alternative answers, to dig deeper. And that's what we're here to do. And so we're going to start this series with a topic that, in my experience, is often where many people start their journey into deconstruction land and asking some hard questions about something that doesn't always seem to make sense. And so uh, this first mini-series is going to be called What the Hell? As we look into the doctrine of hell and see how it's been understood across Christian history, how the Bible actually talks about it, and what we can learn about the nature of God and how the nature of God can shape how we understand it. Now, when I bring up just the concept of hell... Well, what kind of things come to mind? Uh, what pictures do you see? What have you heard it's like, maybe in Sunday school or in a sermon? What's the point of it? How necessary is it? Now, I think if you dig into some of those images that spring to mind off the, at the start, you're going to think of things like Dante's Inferno with these circles and ironic punishment or something like Paradise Lost. And I assume that most uh, who are watching this were taught some form of hell as everlasting conscious torment. Uh, this is sometimes called the infernalist position, which infernal is a pretty good descriptor of, of this uh, the theology, I would say. So when I look at scripture and various theologies that think about it, what I see are really three main streams of thinking about the purpose of hell. And it's a question of, does the fire of hell torture, destroy, or purify? And we'll talk about uh, how the fire may not be literal later on. Uh, but I would say it's hard to argue that any one of those positions, that the Bible is 100% consistent, that that's the only view it has. All of those views can be found in Scripture. Uh, it, and so you have to do a little more thinking to, to find a consistent view. But what tends to happen is that people uh, latch onto one aspect and then interpret passages about the others through their preferred view. And so if we're going to you know, dig deeper and, and think uh, in, a, in a deeper way, we have to think about the nature of God. What do these different views say about who God is? How do they reflect the nature of God? Beliefs about this or any topic can be a mystery. Again, I'm not going to give you all the answers to everything. There can be mystery, but it shouldn't be contradictory, where things clearly cannot line up together. Now, this is a big question, and it's one that we do often start with. One, because it's difficult, and also because you know questions about what happens after we die are, are just one of the big things that come to mind. And also, it's not just about the next life, it's, it's about this life. You know, many will ask, well, what happens if there is no hell? Maybe that's a, a question you've had. Would you live differently if it weren't there? Now, as we're going to see uh, in the Old Testament, so a major portion of Scripture, there really isn't an idea of afterlife uh, punishment. 
And yet they still were concerned there, all those writers, God was concerned about how people lived. There was still a purpose, even without that threat. And a passage that I think should be central for all of us comes from 1 John 4, where John is talking about the nature of God and the nature of love. He says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. So if love, not fear, is where we're heading, how do we fit this in? Are we motivated by fear, or are we motivated by love? What motivates our evangelism or, or why we do the things that we do in God's name? I mean, were we spreading good news or were we just spreading bad news with also some fire assurance attached if you want it? Now, maybe the question some need to ask is, if you're afraid of losing the concept of hell or even just changing it, what does that say about your faith? Well, as we're going to get into all of these big picture questions, we want to kind of take a tour through Scripture. And as I mentioned, start with where hell is or really isn't talked about in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. Now, one of the issues that we're dealing with is one of translation. The Bible was not written in English, uh, and so the word hell is an English word. And we got to figure out when biblical writers are using their words, is it the same concept? Uh, they're referring to the same place, to the associations that we have with the word hell. Well, were those shared by the biblical writers? Um, the English word hell come, uh, probably comes from the Anglo-Saxon, and it means to hide. A hell hole uh, is kind of the idea. It's redundant there. Uh, but if you go to the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew word is sheol. Uh, this is the word that is found most often, and it's really referring to the realm of the dead. Hell is not a good translation for the Hebrew term Sheol. Some Bible translations do that, older ones did, uh, newer ones tend not to. Uh, they'll either just leave it untranslated or they'll say something like the grave or the pit. Uh, and that's probably a better way of understanding it. Sheol in the Old Testament is not a place of punishment. It's just where the dead go. Really across the Old Testament, uh, at least until you get into the very latest books, there's not really a developed concept of the afterlife. You know, they'll talk about Sheol or resting with the ancestors, but we don't really know everything that they believed or if they had really uh, fleshed a lot of that out. It's only toward when you get towards the time between the Old and New Testament and into the New Testament that there's really a lot of development and understanding and revelation about this. Now, as you get into the New Testament, and now we're uh, seeing writings in Greek, the Greek equivalent to the concept of Sheol in the Old Testament is Hades. Uh, now, if you know anything about Greek mythology, you've probably heard that term, uh, but that's the use, the word that New Testament writers would use to translate that Old Testament word. We know this because there's a Greek version of the Old Testament, or you can go to a place like Acts 2.31. Peter is quoting from Psalm 16, and where in the Psalm it said Sheol, he says Hades. Right? So those are the same thing. Um, and so Hades is not this a place of punishment either. It's uh, where people are waiting until judgment. Right? Because by the time of the New Testament, we have the idea of resurrection, which is its own video. If I could put a counter up here, uh, I would mark every time that I say, we'll get back to that or we'll come to that in another video, because apparently that's one of the things I do a lot. Uh, but resurrection is a topic for another time. Hades could be understood, though, as a place of waiting until that point. You could also say that's where Jesus was between the cross and the resurrection. First Peter 3 and 4 maybe allude to that. And so when we're thinking about Sheol or Hades as just the place of the dead, well, is that a literal place or, or that you can go find, or is it just a metaphorical description of the state of death, of being in the grave? Uh, you could take it either way. It's unclear what they mean. I, I tend to read it more as the unconscious state, that it's a bit more metaphorical. Now, getting to the topic at hand, the actual word hell, as we translate it, it's actually pretty rare. Uh, there are only 12 uses in the entire New Testament 
uh, and most of them are actually by Jesus. Uh, although really there's only six unique statements, right? You have Matthew, Mark, and Luke that are telling the same stories or teachings. And so half of those are just those being repeated across those three gospels. What that also means is that there are no uses by the apostle Paul in his writings of the word for hell. There are none in Acts where we often think of there being a lot of preaching about the gospel. They never include hell in that. Uh, now, there are other ways that the New Testament refers to afterlife punishment or discipline or final judgment. Uh, we have the lake of fire, and famously in Revelation, uh, that may be the same thing, but we want to be careful not to just immediately conflate terms if they're talking about different things. And Revelation, another, another time, is very metaphorical. The Hades is thrown into the lake of fire, so we're seeing all the complicated ways already these, these metaphors are being used and brought together. Again, if we start with the concept of hell being torture in fire forever, well, then you just kind of fit everything into that. But we want to let the text speak for themselves on their own terms and recognize that there were developments over time across Scripture and that different authors talk about things in different ways. I think when we just acknowledge how rarely the term is used, it's fair to say that we have overemphasized hell in much of Christianity. The phrase heaven and hell never occurs in Scripture. And yet I know that was a lot of the preaching that I heard was all about which one you end up in. But maybe hell is not as central as is often thought. Now, I've mentioned the word that is translated as hell in the New Testament, and that word is Gehenna. Now, Gehenna actually refers to a real place on earth, not in the underworld. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that it's not also referring to, you know, some spiritual place or metaphor, but we want to start with what it actually refers to. And so Gehenna refers to the Valley of Hinnom, or the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom. This was a gorge that was southwest of Jerusalem. Uh, it's also some, sometimes called Topheth, which means place to spit upon, giving you an idea of uh, how people felt about it. Hinnom, uh, or Gehenna was a place of child sacrifice. Uh, we see this in 2 Chronicles 28, 2 Kings 23. Uh, just King Josiah, one of the good kings, defiles this evil site, uh, trying to, to reclaim it and make it not as bad. And so, Right, child sacrifice, the worst thing that, that people could do, offering their children to other gods. Uh, that's what this place represents. And prophets like Jeremiah would use Gehenna or Topheth as uh, an illustration of what judgment was coming for the people who were doing these sort of things. And so in Jeremiah 7, here's what the prophet says. They go on building the high place of Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom to burn their sons and their daughters in fire, which I did not command, and nor did it come into my mind. Therefore, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when it will no longer be called Topheth, or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. For they will bury in Topheth until there is no more room. All right, so that's uh, still pretty bleak. But what Jeremiah is referring to there is the destruction that came soon after of the, the city of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. Uh, it is harsh judgment, like I said, but it's not that some sort of eternal conscious torment in the afterlife. It's direct consequences for evil that they were doing. And uh, the writer Brad Jersick says this about it. He said, we ought to note the irony of the church utilizing the very place where God became violently offended at the literal burning of children as our primary metaphor for a final and eternal burning of God's wayward people in literal flames. Right? In Jeremiah, God says, I didn't even think about doing these sort of things. And yet we latch on to that as like, well, yeah, that's, that's what God's going to do. Uh, now, there are some apocalyptic writers between the time of the Old and New Testaments uh, that use Gehenna as a metaphorical place of afterlife punishment. But really what we want to focus on is how does Jesus use this concept? Because his teaching is the most relevant. We believe that Jesus most fully reveals the nature of God but he's also one of the main writers in the New Testament, uh, or main voices in the New Testament, that uses this term. 
Now, Gehenna was still a real place in Jesus' day. It had become kind of the garbage dump outside of Jerusalem. At one point, people thought maybe it also was on fire. I don't think there's actually good evidence for that. Uh, and so I want to read one of these passages where Jesus talks about it. This is from Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 43. But where it says Gehenna, or where it says hell in most English Bibles, I'm going to read the Greek word Gehenna. So Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 43. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to Gehenna, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to enter life lame than have two feet and be thrown into Gehenna. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into Gehenna, where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. So, when Jesus is talking about this, can you say for certain that he's talking about what happens after you die? You know, like the prophets, Jesus was concerned about his people and about Jerusalem. And most often, when he's talking about things that were coming to pass soon, uh, possibly negative things if people didn't repent and change, he was also, like the prophets, talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, which happened about 40 years after his death. Uh, that line in, in Mark about the worm and fire, that's directly from Isaiah 65, another place talking about uh, a time of destruction and then restoration. And so Gehenna, again, uh, in a kind of uh, prophetic, poetic irony, became a place of uh, destruction. When Rome came in and destroyed Jerusalem again, that's where they piled many dead bodies and burned them. You know, there are a lot, like I said, predictions of Roman destruction that we read as reference to final judgment. So Mark 13, Luke 21, Matthew 24, they're really talking about something that was relevant to Jesus' time, not something that hasn't happened yet. And so we see that Jesus also is using Gehenna as a term, a concept for judgment, but it's about the way that our self-destructive choices lead to consequences in this life and affect other people. I mean, really, what is it like to live a life that is motivated by lust and greed, like he talks about with your hand or your eye there? Our sin, and that's not just personal, it's also communal, it puts us through hell, and that matters. Jesus cares about it, the prophets cared about it, and we should too. And there may be a sense in which Jesus is referring to some sort of spiritual sense, but we don't have to spiritualize everything that he says about this life because Jesus cares about it. At the same time, the age to come matters. So we have to think about what is the nature of it. Now, one of the most common terms that is attached both to, I guess, the good place and the bad place is eternal. Right? So you have eternal life. And then you have something like eternal destruction. Now, this word, uh, ionios, we have to ask, is this, this adjective, is it describing how long it lasts, or is it describing what it's like? Is it duration or quality? Is it time or type? We could think of it as unlimited time, or maybe timelessness. Again, how do you understand God, God's nature? That's for another time. Is it something that happens forever? Is it something that happens and then endures forever? Right? These are, these are all valid questions that we sometimes just take for granted when we hear the word eternal. Now, this, this term, ionios, probably is better translated, if you're trying to just be literal, as, as meaning of the age to come. Right? Because the Greek ion uh, translates the Hebrew word olam, and both of those words just mean age. Right? And that's a term that's very common through Scripture to refer to a, a period of time, a type of time. Now, very often, it's we have the present age and the age to come. And so something ionios, eternal, has qualities of that coming age. Jesus' resurrection is kind of the peak example and also the gift of the Spirit, right? These are both signs that in some sense the age to come has broken into this present age. 
It's a inaugurated eschatology, which just means that the end times are kind of already starting. And so even when Jesus talks about having eternal life, he almost always says that in present tense as something that we experience now, not just like a ticket that we have to go somewhere else later. And so in the book of Hebrews, for example, uh, the author there talks about eternal redemption in Hebrews 9. And he clearly isn't saying that Jesus is eternally in the process of redeeming us. The thing he says over and over in this sermon is that it happened once and for all. Redemption happens once through Christ, and then that endures into the coming age. And so on the flip side, we have eternal destruction in a place like 2 Thessalonians 1. But does that mean that you're eternally being destroyed, as in tortured, the infernalist position? Or does it just mean that you would be destroyed for eternity? I think the second one makes more sense. And if we're just getting into grammar here, eternal is not an adverb modifying an action. Uh, It's right, so it's not destroying, it's an adjective. It modifies an event, destruction. And, you know, if, if you're really taking that at face value, it's saying if you're separated from the source of life, well, what else is there? How could anyone live? How could there be any sort of ex- existence apart from the one in whom we live and move and have our being? And so, you know, we're already seeing many of the problems that come with this infernalist view, the view of eternal conscious torment. But we also want to take seriously the view that hell could be a way of describing destruction or annihilation of of a person at death if they're not in Christ. So, for example, if I say my house was destroyed in a fire, well, what happened to it? it? It's not burning forever. That's not an ongoing process. The fire consumed it, and so it is destroyed. Um, I can't just get that house back uh, because it's gone. Uh, And if you read a lot of passages, even passages that we know well, we can kind of see that's actually what they're saying. You know, if you were going to take the infernalist position and read, for example, the most well-known verse, John 3.16, here's how it would read. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not be tortured forever with fire, but have eternal life. We all know that's not what it says. It says, shall not perish and so unquenchable fire doesn't necessarily mean that it, you're going to you will be burning in it forever sinners are tortured forever it just means that it won't go out until it's accomplished what it needs to do now what that purpose is uh, destruction purification torture that's the question but it doesn't inherently mean that you're going to be experiencing this fire forever Uh, One of the phrases that that shows up a lot in in Revelation especially is this ongoing smoke or fire. Uh, And when we see that in Revelation, we see in the prophets, usually that's an allusion to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, which again, those people were not tortured, they were destroyed, and that destruction was permanent. And they're destroyed and they're not coming back for the sin of not having hospitality, nothing to do with homosexuality, another video. Uh, So this idea of destruction or perishing, it it shows up many times through the New Testament across uh, different writers, the Gospels, and and Paul. Uh, Jesus in uh, Matthew 10, 28 talks about destroying the the soul. Uh, Here this could be that spiritual use of of Gehenna. Now it's it's unclear whether he's talking about God or death or Satan. I would say it's uh, not necessarily God. That um, doesn't make as much sense to me. His point there is, you know, people can't kill the soul, but it can be destroyed. There are are bigger forces at work. Or Paul in Romans 2.12 says, all who have sinned will perish. Same word, apolumai in Greek. Uh, That's Paul's most common term for the fate of sinners. And there he's contrasting it with the gift of immortality and the life of the age to come. Uh, fury and wrath and anguish and distress, those all come with it. But it's not required that those go on forever. Maybe perish just means perish. As I said before, Paul never uses the term for hell. Now, 
we can make a distinction here between Paul and uh, Plato, the, a Greek thinker whose philosophy was very influential by the time of the New Testament. Because Plato uses a lot of those same terms for death, destruction, perishing. And he says that the soul is immune from those things. And so it's actually Greek philosophy that says that the soul uh, is immortal and lives forever, no matter what happens to the body. Um, Paul and Jesus don't necessarily have that same view. Instead, immortality is God's gift. It's not necessarily inherent uh, to the soul. As we think about this concept of annihilationism, of, of that the end, that hell is just being gone, some people might say, well, that's not good enough. But I want to ask those people, why do you need something worse than that? Why do you need torture for people who have done wrong in God's eyes, but really in your eyes? Uh, why do they need that instead of just not existing anymore? Augustine, or Augustine, uh, if you're a, a Bible nerd like me, he said, where a very serious crime is punished by death and the execution of the sentence takes only a minute, no laws consider that minute as the measure of the punishment, but rather the fact that the criminal is forever removed from the community of the living. What he's saying is that the punishment is not how long you have to be punished, it's the result of it. And to me, that is a, a more merciful view of things, more merciful than everlasting torture. Annihilation certainly has biblical backing, but is there an even more merciful option when we think about what happens at the end, where does the nature of God revealed in Christ lead us? Well, that's going to be the topic of our next video. So we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us today. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss any of these videos. They're going to come out uh, once a week. Look forward to having you with us. We'll get back to what the hell next time.